Yay, and we're live. Hi. <laughs> um, so welcome to Let's Talk Grassroots. Um, I'm Holly and I'm a founder um, of Indigo Volunteers. And we've got a real hi so we've got a really great guest this week. Um, if you've got any questions at all, oh yes, he's found out how to do the video requests. Great. Um, if you've got any questions at all about what's happening with refugees in Greece at the moment or what's the history, like how have we got to where we are, he is your man. Um, so very excited to get him joining the call. But in uh, first of all, um, just to say that we are still looking for... Um, uh, call it, hi Molly. <laughs> so great to see you. Um, we're still looking for qualified nurses and doctors and um, uh, we, we are... Uh, looking when it's safe to open applications for other volunteers so again keep po um, yourself um, posted on our um, socials and on our website and just keep looking there um, if you've got any questions please ask them at any stage we love questions and I'm just gonna let Nick join now hopefully it works yes Nick Hey Ali, how are you doing? I'm so good. How are you? I'm good. Um, just came back from Thessaloniki, back to Athens. Um, I'm at home, and everything good. Yay! Nice. Um, so, just to introduce you, you are. I'm going to get your title right: Advocacy and Data Officer. <laughs> yep, Not the other way around. So I didn't idea. <laughs> Advocacy and Data Officer for Help with the Genius Choose Love. Um, so, yes. of course, um, you have a lot of knowledge. And I think it would be really great um, before we get into how did you get into this position, which I know a lot of people watching really like to know how do people even get into this um, sector and into their positions. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's, let's get straight into what's the situation like in Greece now for refugees? Because that's where you're an expert in. For, for me, you're an expert. <laughs> I try. Uh, I think, well, there's so many issues going on. Like this year has been crazy so far, I think, like for everyone, but especially in Greece. Um, since the beginning of this year, we've seen massive protests on the islands, uh, a border crisis with Turkey, where Greece like completely um, suspended the right to apply for asylum. Mm -hmm. um, we're on a mass scale, the people putting people in detention. Um, and at the same time, we had the like the COVID-19 crisis where the government completely locked down the country as well as um, the uh, reception centers where like refugees and asylum seekers are staying on the islands. Um, mm -hmm. And using still now that most of the country is open again as a pretext to um, keep asylum seekers and refugees inside um, these centers on the island. Um, one of the things that they have been doing, um, for me, it feels like they are changing laws like every week um, and especially laws um, regarding to asylum seekers um, and procedures and making the procedure really unfair for people to get refugee status. And, yeah. and sort of like as a, like a cherry on top, they are really trying to make the, the work of NGOs difficult, um, extremely difficult, if I'm honest. And that is that's quite a summary and that is literally just in the last weeks or months right that's, that's yeah that's no that's since the beginning of this year like um it's basically <laughs> like to put it frank like a shit show it's, <laughs> it's it's been an absolute shit show and, and i don't know how you've been keeping on top of it um so do you want to just go into um just to talk about what you're also doing advocacy work right and yeah. so you're, you're working on advocacy campaigns what what campaigns in particular are you working on because there's so much going on what are you working on and how do you choose them um well at the moment we are like mainly focusing on housing and accommodation um, because the government mm -hmm. recently decided that recognized refugees uh, need to leave their accommodation which is about eleven thousand people which is a crazy amount of people um, who were sort of told that they needed to leave their housing also amidst a global pandemic um, and what we've done so far is we've written a letter to the ministry um, and to like EU, EU commissioner and um, like people within the EU who are um, related to the subject, um, just telling them like basically you can't do this. Um, you need to give people more time to like find alter alternative accommodation um, to help them properly to integrate. Um, 
And that kind of helped. Like um, so far, we haven't seen really mass evictions. Um, people are sort of refusing to leave their accommodation just by saying like, I don't want to become homeless. Like I don't want to have my family on the streets. Um, so it's sort of like putting pressure uh, where it hurts and making sure that the right people are aware um, of what's going on. And so why, what's their rationale for evicting? Like how do they pick who to evict and why are they evicting those people? So one of, like it's, it's part of like a very um, like elaborate sort of scheme by the government to try to um, decongest the islands um, because on the Greek islands there are currently 17,000 people um, in camps that are way, way over their capacity. For example, on Samos there are almost 7,000 people um, where there is a capacity for 650. And one of the things that the government is trying to do is um, to make space, literally make space on the, on the mainland. Um, and that is to um, sort of force recognized refugees, so people who get like international protection, to leave their accommodation, to make like room free for people on the islands um, to get in those accommodations. Yeah. And have you got examples of, of advocacy campaigns that have worked? Like what, what have you seen what are the changes that you've seen um i think the biggest one or like the biggest success that we we had so far is when greece suspended the fundamental right to asylum like at the beginning of march um which is like a huge violation of international law but um, both from the greek side and from european union there was like a deafening silence um about it and people sort of especially like people in power were um like keeping silent about it for almost yeah. the whole month of March. And what we did is we wrote a joint statement together with um, like other organizations. And for that statement, about 250 organizations joined, um, which is sort of like unseen within Greece, but like I think in the wider context uh, of Europe as well. And I think that really showed like how strong um, like a movement can be because it really put pressure on the Greek government. Um, and in the end, like, they finally sort of um, let the people who came into Greece under the suspension of asylum ap apply for um, for asylum and uh, no longer kept them in detention, which is like a, a success. That, that's amazing. But for those mm -hmm. that, are, that are watching that don't necessarily know the procedure ordinarily, so people um, that, that made it to the Greek islands, normally they yeah. could apply for asylum, yeah. but for the entire month, the Greek authorities just said, no, no, you can't. Yeah. So basically <laughs> what happened is, yeah, so basically what happened is, is that um, at one point Turkey said, we're no longer going to stop people from uh, like crossing the Turkish border into Greece. And then like mm -hmm. thousands of people went to the border, um, like the land border in Greece, but also like on the, the different like coast, coastal points um, to try to get into Greece. And as mm -hmm. a sort of response, Greece said like, we're no longer allowing people to apply for asylum. Um, which is a fundamental human right. So like people, everyone yeah. has the right to apply for asylum and also not to be sort of sent back to a country without a proper assessment if they need protection in Europe, so refugee status. Mm -hmm. So basically what the, the Greek government was doing was very illegal, but a lot of people within the European Union um, and as well within the Greek government kept silent about it. Yeah. And um, maybe it's a bit of a... a a difficult question to answer in any concise way but is there any way <laughs> you can you can summarize really what's happened over the since since the um since 2015 you know there's been mm -hmm. um a, a huge surge of refugees arriving and then at first the borders um weren't uh weren't closed so people could go through like could you just give a really rough guide for anyone that really doesn't know what's happened and how we've got to where we are today yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try because it's like a quite a, quite a journey so far. But um, yeah. basically what happened in 2015 is that a lot of people um, came from Greece or came, came from Turkey to Greece to seek asylum here and move to other European countries. And that sort of overwhelmed Greece, but also um, the rest of Europe, like Germany, France, most of the Western countries. And as sort of as a response, they um, concluded a statement with Turkey um, in order to sort of make sure that people stay inside of Greece to um, like have the whole asylum procedure done there. 
And from there, um, like Greece would send people back as well to Turkey if they wouldn't be able to get asylum here in Europe, um, which basically trapped people on the islands. Um, so everyone who enters Greece needs to stay on the islands um, until their asylum procedure is finished, uh, which could take up to between a year to two years for some people. Um, and it trapped also all these people in like these camps that have like deplorable um, conditions, like way overcrowded, um, no proper support. Um, and with this new government um, that has came into power since um, the end of 2019, um, they are really trying to um, stop people from coming to Greece. So they really focus on border protection which also yeah. results in illegal pushbacks. So what the Greek government is doing now, um, at least like they're saying they're not doing it, but there's a lot of evidence that they're doing it, is stopping people from entering Greek waters and sort of pushing them back to Turkey, which is also highly illegal. Um, but with that and combined with like all the measures against COVID-19, there's a huge drop in people arriving in Greece. Um, and at the same time, they are changing laws um, like almost every week, um, it seems like they already had like three big changes in law, like since, I think since two months and making really making the asylum procedure um, in a way that it's really easy to reject people. So trying to get as many people rejected for refugee status within Greece and also at the same time um, finding a way to deport them to other countries. So back to Turkey mm -hmm. or back to the country of origin. Um, that's and basically said, in a nutshell. That, that was a fabulous summary. <laughs> and yeah. I really put you on the spot there. And you've said um, about uh, COVID-19 and before and how that's been used as a bit of a cover-up for um, other ulterior motives, but getting, getting things done um, under the yeah. guise of COVID-19. Do you want to just explain that a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. So I think... One of the things that happened, like I think Greece is, was one of the countries that responded the fastest um, when COVID-19 arrived in, uh, in Europe. So they completely closed down the country, the borders, um, people weren't allowed to go on the streets without permission. And the same sort of applied to refugee camps um, on the islands, but also on the mainland. So people were restricted from going in and out of these camps, um, which sort of was counterproductive because like let's take Lesbos, uh, Moria as an example there's at that time there were around 18,000 people inside of the camp with no possibility to like um, social distance or like keep proper hygiene because like there's so many people that everything is under pressure um, mm. you saw like pictures from people standing in line hours for waiting for food with like not even a few centimeters between them um, which like completely divide any logic um, with the with like the measures that the Greek government imposed on like the general um, population, and what we've mm -hmm. seen now is that um, most of these restrictions that were put in place are like completely a go off. So mm -hmm. um, people are allowed to travel again. Um, like people from abroad are like allowed to come back to Greece as well, um, like tourists as well. Um, but at the same time, they keep on having these restrictions on movements in these camps, which sort of uh, makes like a divide between what applies to the general population and mm. what applies to refugees and asylum seekers in Greece. Um, mm. And there's been reports from the European Union as well that says like these mass uh, like restrictions on movement for refugees, they don't have any um, legitimate reason um, or like public health reason to keep them ongoing. So for now they are um, saying that they, like these measures um, restricting movement for refugees are gonna last until the 21st of this month. Um, but mm -hmm. there is a possibility to, um, that they're gonna extend them again, because I think this has been the third extension um, of yeah. restrictive restrictions on movement. Um, and at the same time, what this government is doing is they are trying to make every camp in Greece, so on the mainland, but also on the islands, um, close structures where they are going to sort of restrict the entry and exit of people in there. Um, and that's, that's also... A new new thing, right? So just to put it into yeah. perspective for those who don't know, some of the camps are 
on the outskirts or edge of, of, a, of a small town or village or, or something. Yeah. Some of them are really close. And people that are living inside the camps are having different rules, restrictions put on them yeah. than, than locals. And so locals are being told, yeah, you can go out now, a restaurant's open, you can go here and there. And yet people yeah. in the camp who are already very stuck and enclosed are not able yeah. to, to leave the camp or very few. I think they're giving out some permits sometimes, but, but that's, that's completely it. So correct. It, and, yeah, we are um, like allowed to get our coffees. We are allowed to like go to like coffee is a big thing in Greece. Um, we're allowed to go <laughs> like for dinners, um, go on holiday to the islands. And but at the same time, you have almost 17,000 people on the islands where for each camp, around 100 people a day are allowed outside to do like essential shopping, for example, for groceries or medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest of them are like not allowed to go outside. And what this created as well, like um, I've recently been to Kios and to Lesbos, is like it increases a lot of tensions inside of these camps. Um, there was already a lot of tension, but now you really see like a sharp increase in like violent incidents, um, intercultural uh, like tensions so people are literally saying like we are stuck here we need to get out because um, like it also affects a lot of people their mental health as well of course like it's already a really difficult situation and and again um for those that don't know um oh by the way anyone can ask questions like i've got loads but feel free if you've got questions like you know from basic like what is a refugee or how do they get here or anything like then ask nick he's yeah. your man um <laughs> So for those that don't know, what, what is generally, what, what is a camp like and, and how do they differ? Because um, you mentioned about closed structures as well. Maybe you can just briefly explain what that is and, and how the camps differ from each other across the locations. Yeah, so on the islands, um, you have what's called reception and identification centers. So that's where everyone who arrives in Greece goes to, um, to be identified, to get paperwork and to apply for your asylum. And these are basically um, like huge structures um, where people are sort of trapped until their asylum procedure is finished. Um, but at the same, like there are too many people inside of these camps um, to them, like for them to function properly. So mm -hmm. I worked for a long time in Samos um, where you had between 7,000 and 8,000 people on a hill, really windy, very steep, um, just living in tents um, because there's no no room for them from them inside of the camp um, no working toilets no working showers um, the food that is provided by the army is most of the times like not fresh and, and like no nutrition at all um, the trash is not properly collected so like you have trash everywhere in the summer you have a lot of problem with snakes with rodents um, they're basically like terrible places to live and like their shame towards Europe as well um, that we allow this as the European Union to happen within the European Union. Um, yeah and that's, a, that's a, a really great point so how how do you feel the European Union or Europe as a whole has responded? Um, not very well. Um, I think like you should should always there are a lot of people making like a lot of effort to like try to change the situation um, but what mm. we have seen so far is that the like the normal response of the European Union is is that they say we provide Greece with money to improve the situation but since 2015 there haven't been like very structural changes to improve the living conditions of these people so I think only recently um, we've seen sort of a movement towards solidarity with Greece, which is great, um, that other mm. countries are starting to acknowledge, like, it's not only about money. Um, Greece is a very bureaucratic country um, that it's super difficult to get things done here. And they need more support um, from other countries. So, for example, with the asylum procedure, but also just with basic stuff like containers for camps. Um, there have been other European countries who've sent um, like a, a big amount of containers where people can live in to camps so that they don't have to live in tents. Um, and they're trying to sort of negotiate a new asylum pact. Um, so sort of like a, um, like a whole system of asylum which applies to many European countries 
which is more fair, which doesn't put all the pressure on uh, countries as Greece or Italy or Cyprus, um, yeah. but like provides a bit more solidarity from the rest of Europe. Yeah, it's, it, it doesn't really make sense that just because geographically it's the first, yeah. they're the first country that, that people hit, um, that they have to bear this massive burden. And I know that, yeah, exactly, the, the EU say they give money, but it's, it's very hard to understand, you know, if you give millions or billions of, of euros, where is that? It's not trickling down to where um, it should perhaps be going, because why are people queuing for hours for really unnutritious food? Or why is there a yeah. severe lack of toilets and actually it's NGO, small grassroots that are building those toilets? Yeah. You know, like, where is that money going? And that's the most basic thing, right? It's just shelter, accommodation, safety, and that's, that's really missing. So it's really interesting where this, where this money is going. Do you know where it's going? <laughs> Um, well, suppose like a lot of it is going to um, as well to the army um, to provide like um, basic things inside of these camps. Um, a lot also goes, for example, to IOM and UNHCR to provide basic um, basic services. Um, but what like what like as you said, you don't see like drastic changes happening. Like you can put like millions towards Greece, but I haven't seen it. And I've been here for two years. I've been following the situation in Greece for like, uh, for a longer time. It's, it's not changing. Um, like there are no drastic change in the conditions in the camps. And um, does this money go towards the cash card? Oh, it's loading. Please come back. I have none of these answers. <laughs> Quite how Nick says them. Um, Okay, hopefully he'll come back in a second. Come on, Nick. I'm not sure if it's uh, Sophie Earpiece. Uh, is he is he loading for you too? Okay, he's gone off. Um, so that's super interesting. So for those that have just joined us, uh, Nick is a uh, data and advocacy, no, advocacy and data, I keep saying the wrong around, officer for Help Refugees Choose Love. And he is just super informed on all of these uh, topics related to refugees and Greece. And you're back, yeah. Just in time. Yes. We're a bit, um, I got a bit of a wobbly Wi-Fi. Um. <laughs> we're in green. This happens. Um, so um, I was just saying, so the money from the EU, is that what goes towards cash cards? And, and can you explain what cash cards are? Yeah, of course. So um, cash cards are a European-funded uh, system, which is being um, like done by the UNHCR, which is a UN organization. And it's basically a way to provide um, asylum seekers and refugees um, with a bit more um, like independence their money for. So like everyone in Greece who applies for asylum, who gets registered, gets a card. And with that card, they can decide how to spend their money. So for example, there can be groceries, there can be um, like medicine that they need um, and the, the amount of money that people receive like depends on the like how big the family is or like if it's a single person and for example it just increases with the amount of children within the family mm. but, and, and is it enough to cover you know the basics of food and clothing and, and shelter for a family for example no so i think like, you should look at like a, a month um, mm, wow which is not a lot. Um, and so, for example, people are not able to. Oh, no, I've lost, I've lost you again, but I think you're back. Sorry, I, I didn't catch the end of that. <laughs> so it's 150 a month that I got, uh, but it's not enough. Yeah, I think you, like a good example is people who need to buy medicine. So like they are relying on medicine. Um, it's very difficult, or it used to be very difficult to get the um, state funded Mm. Um, mm. benefits um, for help. We've also, um, um, I, I, I work there a week at the medical clinic and um, we, mm -hmm. we know that um, patients also go to see the doctors within the camp and the camp doctors just don't have um, the most basic um, equipment needed or, or you know, yeah. even uh, if, a, a, a boy that went to hospital needed his stitches out they didn't have a stitch cutter so he was just like well buy me a stitch cutter and I can take them out <laughs> obviously where is this 14 year old boy going to get a stitch cutter from so we hear that and I don't think that 
um, uh, the, the doctor is necessarily being difficult. I really think that they, they also really lack resources themselves. So yeah. it's, um, yeah, where, so it's, it's things like that. And medicine is really expensive part of that the cash cards go to. So that's, yeah, it's definitely, definitely not enough money as far as I know as well. Um, I'm, I'm aware that um, I'm asking loads of questions. If anyone else has got some, um, please feel free to ask them. Um, I want to kind of get on a bit um, towards um, you um, mm -hmm. and what were you doing for those that were thinking, wow, how could I ever be in Nick's position knowing all this stuff and working on advocacy? What were you doing before this and how did you get into the field? Um, I think like there's not really sort of anything that you can, uh, there's not like a specific study to become uh, like an advocacy officer, but for example, having a background in international relations or just knowing how the European Union works is like very helpful. Um, I study international law as well, because a lot of thing, these things are related to uh, like legislation and laws. Um, and just basically being on the ground. I think my um, sort of informal nickname within the organization is King Formation because I just try to keep up to date with everything. Like I read around two or three um, like reports a day. I follow the news, um, even like just how depressing it could be. I still keep on like reading everything that happens within Greece. Um, and based on that, um, you can really see like the changes that are happening and, and sort of things where we need to put pressure. So sort of exposing the government or like the European Union and saying like, this is like completely wrong. You need to do something about it. I don't know how you find the time for this um, at all. We've got a really great question mm -hmm. from, oh, sorry, I think it's Madeleine, but the name keeps disappearing. And um, what is the dynamic between larger NGOs and smaller grassroots NGOs? It's a really great question. I hope I, I, hope I saw your name correctly. Um, I think for like advocacy wise, I think we sort of most of the times have a slightly different agenda because we see like the, the smaller things happening on the ground, which so are like really frustrating for a lot of people working in this sector. Um, but I think, well, like in the beginning, we just discussed like all the things that are happening at this moment in Greece. Um, and it also brought the bigger NGOs and the smaller NGOs together because it really shows that we need to um, like form a united front um, in mm. um, like say making statements towards the, the government and to the European Union. So that's like a really positive development um, recently. And especially for example, about the NGO registration, um, which is something where the government really tries to make the, like the work of NGOs difficult in Greece. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we really like together with other NGOs, was like small or big or to like persuade and put pressure on the government to change this yeah and it, that's such a it's such a great question because it's it, it's um it's such an interesting topic do you think it's improved or declined the relationship between big ngos and smaller ngos or grassroots um like I think it just depends on the organization like there are a few very big organizations who are really helpful um I think that a lot of people within the grassroots sector are, um, I try to put this diplomatic, but um, not very enthusiastic about the work of, for example, UNHCR or IOM, um, because they are the bigger um, institutions working within Greece. Um, and they are very, um, like their way of working is very bureaucratic, um, difficult to get things through. Um, and I think that also makes a lot of like smaller organizations because I think the power of grassroots and smaller NGOs is that they can be really quick. They can work decisively. Um, they can fill the gaps really easily. Um, where, for example, the bigger NGOs, it sometimes can take weeks before something is happening. Um, so I think yeah. there's a lot of like, um, like bigger or organizations who also refer people to smaller organizations because they know that they can um, like help in like a quicker way than other organizations. Um, but at yeah. the same time for like some big organizations, there's also some mis mistrust in what they can do. Yeah, it is it's a bit of a, a difficult one. And I think um, it's so nice because I'm on, I know you were on Samos for a really long time and I'm still on Samos and um, it's quite a unique and rare place to be working with. The collaboration is, is just so good as far as I've, wherever I've worked, it's the best collaboration by far. 
um, particularly with small and, and larger NGOs. Um, we just we just we just get on. Don't know why or how it, it works, but it works, and we're all just really collaborative. And it makes me just wonder why can this not happen elsewhere? Why is there so much politics involved when really everyone is working in the same for the same cause and in the same direction? That that's a whole other topic in itself. Um, so just um, some more personal questions. Um, what surprised you most um, about either working in Greece or, or the, the situation in Greece or the humanitarian sector as a whole? Um, well, just like for like Greece, I think Greece never stops to surprise you or amaze you. And then uh, like in a positive way, but also uh, a lot of times in a negative way. Um, about the sector itself, I think it's um, the resilience of people. So the resilience of refugees, but also international volunteers, um, locals as well, and how much energy and time and effort they put in helping each other. And it's sometimes really easy to um, be very pessimistic about what's happening in Greece because like so many things are happening, so many things are going wrong. But just seeing so many people like willing to put time and energy especially volunteers like just literally putting free time um like to help people here in greece like that gives a lot of energy mm. um are you feeling optimistic or pessimistic about hopeful and unhopeful about the future of this situation um just like based on honest. facts it's gonna be like more towards pessimistic um, but on the other hand there's also sort of a silver lining to this situation because um like the more um like pressure is being put on the sector like on the humanitarian sector and like smaller ngos the more they start working together collaborating um and joining together and that mm. makes them more effective that makes their voice more uh, more powerful um so there is like room for change like we have um like a european commission who's like very new who's like still sort of like easing into their role yeah. um so there are a lot of opportunities for change um and i think yeah. we just need to scream hard enough um or loud enough mm. um and then we can definitely make a change um and it also starts with like individuals. I think like one of the things that a lot of people feel is that they're powerless, that they can't really do anything. Yeah. Um, but just like small things as like, ch like sharing um, like information on um, social media and then reaching, like if I share something, if you share something um, about the situation in Greece, the more people who are aware about the situation, um, like the stronger um, sort of like the public voice becomes. And I think like a really good example yeah. is um, the recent pushbacks. So Greece, like literally um, like the Greek Coast Guard pushing boats that try to come to Greece back towards Turkey, which is highly illegal. And I think for the recent months, this has really become sort of like an institutionalized uh, procedure. But and Greece thought mostly that they could get away with it. Uh, but now people mm -hmm. are sort of starting to realize what's happening mm -hmm. like we we need re this um to sort of make um greece know that like we are watching you um and that led to for example iom unhr and different organizations making public statements about this which started with the grassroots um, like smaller organizations making reports um filing court cases um, about these people who've been pushed back to greece uh, to turkey when they're trying to like seek protection in europe and based on that, like the more people are sort of like making a strong voice against it, the more Greece is thinking like, oh, we're being watched and we need to stop okay. this. And that's like something it, like we can all do. It. Yeah. And I think that's also yeah. the strength of Choose Love like and Help Refugees. Like we have a very powerful and strong movement, um, like on social media, wow. like we post a lot about the situation and just making mm. yourself aware and other people aware of the situation here and um just like one post can reach so many people on social media um and if a lot of people are aware like that already improves the situation yeah and some people even don't know that boats are still arriving for example that happens quite a lot you know that people are like oh you're you're still working in greece like is that still going on and, and of course if you yeah. share a post you don't know, there's so much of your network that might not even be aware of that and i think that's a really great um thing people take away have another question for you 
um, mm-hmm. by Rosie. Thanks, Rosie. Any good platforms, podcasts, websites, Instagram accounts you would suggest to have a look at to share and learn uh, from about what's happening there? Obviously, other than Indigo Volunteers and Help Refugees Choose Love, who do really fabulous um, um, updates and posts all the time of current um, information. Yeah, um, I would say, um, like, I follow so many, so it's just, like, difficult to make, like, a, a selection on it. Um, I would say if you're, for example, interested in, like, a certain thing within Greece, just try to follow organizations who work on that. Um, so, for example, Refugee Rescue um, or any organization that you feel like, okay, this is, like, a good organization and follow their social media um, because they most of the times, po- like, post the most accurate, um, like, information um, and there's a website called Ekaterimi, uh, which is a Greek website, which is in English. And they pu- like publish a lot of um, like info about Greece as well. And yeah, just basically like, for example, what Choose Love does is like we post a lot about what our partners do. So for example, if you see something interested, follow it um, and encourage others to follow it because the stronger the yeah. network, the stronger the voice. Yeah. Um, so if you've got a top three, because you cut out a little bit, if you've got a top three, can you just list them so people can maybe have a little snoop around? I, I heard one Greek one, but I didn't hear um, any others. Um, well, like I, for example, say AG and Boat Report is um, like they post a lot, for example, about yeah. these pushbacks. Um, I think Mobile Info Team is like a very, like they provide like very accurate information. Um, um, on, and for example, if you want to have a bit more like official information, Relief Web, um, also about postings <laughs> about like jobs within the sector, which is really interesting. But Relief Web has a um, like a portal for every country, including Greece. And mm-hmm. that's like a very good way to like receive more um, like official information. So like um, updates on mm. the um, like the number of arrivals in Greece, um, but also statements by, for example, bigger organizations. Yeah. Um, and uh, two more questions for you. Um, mm-hmm. What motivates you in the morning? Um, what motivates me in the morning? I think it's just there's every day there's a new struggle and that keeps it interesting. Like, um, I think can can say like, I honestly have a a job where I'm very passionate about and there's so much going on. Mm. Um, and with everything that we do, we improve some person's life. Like, even if it's a small thing, like if it just makes a difference for like 10 or 15 people, it makes a difference. Um, and that, I think that's what keeps me uh, motivated. And it's also, the situation for a lot of people is really, really unfair. Um, and just being able or being in a position to um, like make changes to that, to like make, uh, to like hold EU, like hold EU um, officials accountable, to hold the Greek state accountable or to pressure to them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really great one. And um, I think I feel the same with the, I, I, and I get excited by not knowing anything that's going to happen for the day. Um, there's always, I have to try my best to put gaps in because you need the gaps to deal with whatever is thrown at you. Um, and mm-hmm. um, lastly, what would you say to anyone that wants to get into this as a volunteer or as a career? Um. Um, read about the general situation like in Greece um, if people want to like for example know where to apply for jobs like feel happy to like reach out um, and I think for me like I think for a lot of people in this sector it's just start volunteering um, because in order to like actually make volunteering into a job you need the, the experience so find something that you're passionate about, like through Indigo, because like they're really good at um, like placing people with like the right skills at the right project um, and just start mm-hmm. volunteering. Do it for a few months, um, do it for a few weeks. And then from there, you can see like which kind of positions are there um, in order to like start working that, in this sector. A phenomenal, 
Uh, that was a phenomenal plug. Thank you. You're, you're cutting out a little bit. So I'm going to um, also finish uh, the Greek Greek Wi-Fi is also finishing, I think, as well. It's going to bed. <laughs> um, Nick, thank you so much for all the advocacy work and all the changes that you make through this. It's really phenomenal. And also, I think this is a really great bite-sized summary for anyone that really doesn't know um, much about the situation. You know, this little video that we'll put on Instagram TV, people can just watch it and and, and get a bit of an introduction if they don't know. So it's, it's really helpful. And um, if anyone's got any other questions, I just message us and we'll try our best to answer them or we'll send them to Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, I'll do my best to answer. answer. Yeah. Um, thanks thank for you joining for everyone. Um, and yes, thank you so much, Nick. Have an amazing rest of your evening. Thank you. Mm.